2004. He emerges and returns to the United States with an even more compelling tale of perseverance as he navigates the rapids of the troubled VA system. He gains a new perspective with a fever of enthusiasm to all patriots across the windswept fields of America. This is Sergeant Dave your host of the Remember the Fallen show in studio, in the Never Forgot Memorial Studio in Seminole County, USA, on the Winter Springs Oviedo line. And we got a special segment today on the unsung heroes of World War II. We have a captain, Moffat Burris, who just, with a heavy heart, just recently died at 99 years old, World War II veteran. And this captain tricked 15,000 Germans into surrendering. Amazing how he tricked that many Germans to surrendering. This hero, World War II paratrooper, right? He was called by the Germans. They were called the devils in baggy pants because paratroopers all airborne. You know how they tuck their pant leg into their airborne boots? So they like got these baggy pants, almost like hammer time, right? So the Germans actually nicknamed them Devils and Devils and Baggy Pants. What a classic, right? So this this hero, unsung hero, you probably haven't heard about him, right? Few people outside of military and veteran circles will likely recognize the name T. Moffat Burris. But the Army veteran stories of valor and heroism during World War II with the stuff every instrument's dream are made of, right? This guy is a legend in this circle of group, right? Burris, who died Friday at age 99. God bless this World War II veteran. The greatest generation. We lost another one. Was deployed to Europe with the 3rd Battalion, 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment from May 1943 to September 1945 and participated in some of the most dangerous Enduring allied missions of the global conflict, including the Battle of Anzio, the Battle of the Bulge, and the Battle for Nijmurgen. Most notably, he fought in the Allies' critical push into Nazi controlled territory in Operation Market Garden. His participation immortalized in a composite role by actor Robert Redford in the 1977 epic war drama, A Bridge Too Far. We all remember that one. His unit was so fearsome, it became known, here it is, as devils in baggy pants by enemy Germans on the battlefield. We were told as paratroopers that were the best, I mean the best, trained to be the best, and we felt that we were the best, Burris told soldiers at the Army Training Center in 2012. There was nothing we couldn't do, right? But while Burris recounted his exploits in his vivid detail and his gripping 2000 memoir, Strike and Hold, one stands out. His single-handed capture of an entire German Panzer Division in April 1945. Here's how we recounted the incident in a June 2000 interview with Fox News. We thought that when we'd gone through that war and to that point, we'd seen the worst we possibly could, but it was not so. Uh, it was just undescribable you know, what it was like. Uh, then we were on the approaches of Berlin. I say approaches about 90 miles. By the time 24-year-old Captain T. Marit Boris had approached Berlin, it was April 1945. He had taken part in the liberation of Wobbling concentration camp. Before that, Captain Boris had jumped during Operation Market Guide and had fought in the battles of Salerno and Angio. But little did Captain Burris know. Another harrowing moment has just around the corner for him. When the Allies neared victory in Berlin, and Captain Burris was given orders to stay put. We had our men 
wide enough, ready to go and take Berlin. And just as we started to step off on the road to Berlin, orders came down from General Eisenhower, stop, do not cross the hill. Political decisions have been made uh, to allow the Russians to take it. I said, I can't stand this any longer. I got my chief and the lieutenant sergeant and said, let's go across the river and see what we can see. See if some crowds still over there. Unfortunately, Captain Burr stumbled into the German Panzer Corps. Unsung hero, Captain T. Moffat Burris. Today's episode, I'm going to continue to honor our World War II veterans due to there's only about a, a handful of a hundred left. So we're going to continue the podcast with a World War II medic finds his friend badly wounded in the battlefield. Memories of World War II, number six. And I knew was coming in our direction. So I'm running down the road, telling him, hit the ditch, damn it, hit the ditch, hit the ditch, or coming in. I knew one was coming toward me. Through 
Throughout the duration of World War II, the continental United States was never in any real danger, and those who served in the armed forces were determined to keep it that way. So when the U.S. was finally drawn into the fight, Melvin Young's response was simple. I enlisted. I enlist for everything. If we're going to do it, let's do it over there. Mel chose the United States Army, but when it came to what his role would be, the Army chose for him. Well, they had us all lined up. They decided, you're going to be this, do, 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 and the rest of you are medics. That's how I become a medic. But when we got to special training and stuff, then we become specialists. We went to special schools and stuff to take people right on the front line, not when they get back to the aid station. When I get done with them, if I could save them, I would send them back to the aid station. You and out there and you get blowed up, whatever might happen, I take care of you right now. So I become a specialist, a surgical technician. Mel joined up with the 94th Infantry Division and in September of 1944 entered Europe by way of Utah Beach at Normandy. D-Day and the fighting on the beach had concluded months earlier, but as the 94th made their way across the French countryside, Mel got his initial introduction with the enemy. We were sitting there, some guy hollered, hit it, Doc! So I fell down, vroom, rapper machine gun bullets went right down where I was sitting. The Germans had sent a patrol up there with a machine gun, they were going to harass you and take off again. I mean, we didn't get no chance at them. But, uh, I mean, all, everybody was trying to do everybody in for some reason. Soon, Mel would learn not just to be on the lookout for German patrols, but also for the traps they would leave behind. A constant potential danger with every step. Somebody says, hey, Doc, I said, yeah, I said, they need you over in the next hill here. I said, call Red and tell him I need a Jeep. We hopped off, went over and down around over and back, back up around here. I jumped off of this Jeep. The guy hollered, hey, Doc, watch it, watch it. Hey, watch what? Well, look down at your foot. Said, you see that bouncing Betty? I said, oh, I seen it. Hell, I didn't see that bouncing Betty. It's only a pin as big as a toothpick. The Allied soldiers had a variety of nicknames for the many German weaponized innovations. One of the most sinister was the bouncing Betty. You trip that thing and it shoots your mind right up to where your ding-dongs is and it'll blow you apart right there, George. That's why they call him Bouncing Betty. Get up this way and bang. We have more names and stuff for stuff like this, but that was a Bouncing Betty. And uh, it bounced right up there and gets you. I said, I seen it. I see that damn thing. As they battled their way across northern France and into Germany, the 94th Infantry Division's tenacity and tough resolve earned them the nickname Patton's Golden Nugget. Still, they were no more immune to casualties than any other unit, and perhaps none became as familiar with the horrors of war as the medics. Big tank sitting right there on the corner. Looked inside and there's a guy sitting there just like this. No head. There was, well, I don't know what you want to call it. There was a torso. I mean, blowed up, you know. No head, no arms, no leg, just a body is all that was laying there in the road. Out here, you're just walking over dead people. I mean, you can't, uh, you can't explain. It's just like walking through a, I mean, it was so common to us. You had to walk through bodies and uh, it's just one of those things. People say, well, how do you do it? Well, I mean, that was day and night. That's all we had. So it didn't make any difference to me. You'd look to see who you can save and who you can't save. Danger, chaos, and death were a constant presence, but Mel had a job to do. In the midst of battle, with shells exploding all around, and the agonizing cries of his wounded men coming from every direction, Mel learned to steady his nerves and focus his mind. I can still do it. That's study with it. You're looking there, who are you going to try to save? So you had to make a lot of decisions. You wondered, did you make them or didn't you die? So that's when I got this point here. You got to get like this, look at them and decide which way they're going to go. So how many was right, how many was wrong, you never know. You just have it in your own mind. You made the right decision at that time because there's no way to tell right or wrong. You have to make it and you can't, can't go back on it. I never did. In January of 1945, Mel would face his toughest decision yet. The 94th Infantry was brought into the Battle of the Bulge to break up the German Panzer Divisions that surrounded the Allies. 
One chilling day, as the 94th stood in the face of German artillery, Mel heard a familiar voice calling for a medic. Braving the onslaught of enemy firepower, Mel raced towards the voice and found Harold Pratt, his closest friend, lying in the snow. Let's see what's wrong, Harold. He was laying in snow about knee deep, and I got down my knee and I was looking at him, we was talking. And I uh, said, boy, he said, boy, I'm sitting in bed, I'm aching in pain. I said, oh, what the heck's wrong, man? He said, I'm, man, it's horrible, horrible. I said, well, tell you what, Harold, that ain't too bad. I said, tell you what I'm gonna do. I said, I'll give you a couple shots here, and I said, it'll, it'll take that pain and stuff away. You won't have to worry enough. His words seemed to calm Harold. But Mel knew there was no way to get him off of the battlefield. And from what Mel had seen, he knew this would be the last time he would talk to his friend. He got a little mark right back here in his hip, as big as a, like the old silver dollar, about something like that. And he's complaining of his stomach. And if you're just out there and got a hole in your hip, you shouldn't be complaining of your stomach killing you. So a piece of shrapnel went up through his hip right there where I got my finger, right maybe your pocket, went up through there and tore his insides off. So what are you going to do with the guy with the pit? His insides tore all, all up? Let him lay there and suffer for hours till somebody could get him or he'd die in pain and misery. So I gave him enough morphine to put him to sleep. Simple as that. A heck of a thing to say and it put a man to sleep, but I did. As the winter season diminished, so did the strength of the German army. The Allies' progress towards Berlin was stronger and faster than ever, but Germany was not yet ready to give up the fight. Mel and the 94th soon encountered yet another of their enemy's deadly innovations, the Screaming Mimi. They made one hell of a noise when they come up through that hill, and they sound a lot different coming at you than when they pass you. Yeah, because I one time a shell went off close to me. That thing went off right here. Man, it slammed me up here like a rotten egg. I'll tell you, it just... Whoa. I still feel my shoulder over now then. It was a close call for Mel that time, but it wouldn't be his last encounter with a screaming Mimi. As spring began to set in, the 94th took a short pause to rest and regroup. For the moment, all was quiet. They'd sent a couple of replacements up. That's what had happened about three days before. They was out there someplace going down, you know, country road. It, it's blacktop, but it's just a short road. And they started up harassing us a little bit with some screaming memes and stuff. They send a shell off someplace. You had an idea whether or not it was heading toward you or this way or that way. But this one I knew was coming in our direction. Mel recognized the sound of the oncoming burst of rockets, but the inexperienced replacements were frozen in confusion. Rather than take cover for himself, Mel raced down the road to warn the two younger men. So I'm running down the road, tell them, hit the ditch, damn it, hit the ditch, hit the ditch, they're coming in. I knew one was coming toward me. Mel dropped to the ground, and the exploding shell tore into his leg. The two young replacements had lunged into a nearby ditch. Only one survived, and he called out for a medic. Finally wiggled myself up, wobbled over, and I patched him up, gave him morphine and stuff. Got him shipped out, and I gave myself a shot of morphine. As Mel waited for his turn to be carried to the field hospital, he became overwhelmed with the realization that his service alongside his brothers in the 94th Infantry was over. I was useless to him. I think that's one of the hardest things I ever had to do, was lay there against the floor, knowing that I was going to go out. Had to go. Now, it don't make sense, but you just get so so tied in as your own group you just fit in you just become one of the crew and go with them eat with them fight with them or whatever might happen i wonder who ever took my place up there not a single day goes by that melvin young doesn't think about the men he saved those he couldn't save and the tough decisions he had to make but after more than seven decades he remains confident that even in the most difficult of situations, he made the right choice. See, I got a lot to live with, but I, I, I wouldn't change any of my decisions. It's just, just a job that I was to do, and I just did it, and I ne never looked back as to whether it was right or wrong. Just like Harold, I wouldn't hesitate for a minute to put him to sleep. I ain't gonna let you lay there. Hard-hearted, no, I'm kind-hearted. I was a good doc.
Hey everyone, I'm Josh from Memoirs of Hey everyone, I'm Josh from Memoirs of World War II, and I just want to say thank you for watching this episode and also give you an opportunity to join up with what we're doing. We're dedicated to reaching as many veterans of the Second World War as we can, both here in the US and across the world, but we're running out of time. The youngest World War II veterans are in their 90s, and every day we're losing more and more of them. So here are three simple ways that you can join with us. First, consider supporting us through Patreon. Patreon is a subscription-based service that keeps projects like this one going. Second, you can share these videos with your family and friends. It's a great way to honor these veterans and get these stories out there. And finally, consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss a single episode. Thanks again for your support and thank you for watching. This next memoir is memoir number one. It's of a 94-year-old World War II veteran shares his story. Trapped all of us in there. That was the worst of all, all of the fighting was there. That was the worst. The Second World War was a massive event and hardly a soul living at the time would go unaffected by it. This is the story of Harry Shaw Jr., nicknamed Pete by those who know him best. Like millions of other Americans, Pete's motivation for volunteering his service would be the very thing that finally engaged the United States into the war, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. But for Pete, the sting of destruction and defeat would hit a little closer to home. My, uh, one of my best friend of Carlo Corella was, which is a great friend of mine. His brother was in the Navy, and he, he was at Pearl Harbor. He'd never come back. I enlisted when I was 17 because they, they couldn't get him fast enough. As the United States delved deeper and deeper into war, more and more servicemen were needed. Not only had Pete long been ready to serve, but he knew exactly where he wanted to be. So we decided, Carlo says, Pete, well, we went all through high school together, grade school together. He was my bestest friend. And he says, we're going in the Navy. But Pete knew his hopes of joining the Navy could be crushed by one unfortunate fact. He was colorblind. And the physical inspection he would need to pass depended on his ability to see a series of faded numbers hidden within various colors. But as the boys stood in line for their inspection, Pete's friend Carlo came up with a plan. He went first, and he says, now when I shot them numbers out, you listen. <clears throat> so he went up there, and he went like 99, 44, 79, what's this? So anyhow, they said, next, now and then, he says, now here's a folder here, and I'm going to turn this folder over page by page, and you'll see all them dots, different colors, and there'll be a number up here. So you tell me what number you see. Now I know what he said. And I did. I went not like 99, 34. He went to pick the next one, and I said, well, whatever it was, 47. But it slipped, and it didn't turn over. He, How'd you know it's set? <laughs> I says, I'm in the army. <laughs> they took a tray out. And dumped it out on the desk, he says, pick out the red. I says, I'm in the Army. <laughs> we took our basic training in what they call Tar Paper City in Dothan, Alabama. They didn't have barracks or nothing. They had four by fours in the ground with tar paper wrapped around them and cots on the sand. That was our bunks. As the need for fresh combat recruits increased, Pete was sent to the United Kingdom to finish his training, now part of the 283rd Field Artillery Battalion. Only months later, he would have his initial introduction into combat by means of the largest seaborne invasion in history, the event that would turn the tide of the war in Europe, D-Day. On June 6, 1944, Pete would make his landing on Utah Beach at Normandy. As the American infantry cleared the beach of German opposition, Pete brought the heavy artillery onto the shore. They cleared the shore. We, we, we went on the LSTs. That had, was like a barge with the front went down. Then we pulled right out and pulled the trailers with us. We took all that stuff with us. 
As part of a convoy carrying supplies and heavy weapons, Pete traveled primarily at night under the cover of darkness while the German Luftwaffe patrolled the skies above. And there were no lights. You couldn't use a light. They had what they call cat eyes. They have a little light that, that big, one inch by half an inch light. That's what, that's what you went by. Well, where that Jeep or command car went, we followed them, but all we followed was them two little cat eyes. But that's how they traveled, so that we didn't get shelled at night, because they were up there. We had pretty good success, but we had a couple of experiences that weren't too good. But that's kind of hard. <laughs> Next, Pete and the 283rd moved on to St. Lo. The French city had been under German occupation for four years and was now a strategic objective in the battle for Normandy. But the enemy opposition there was stronger and more relentless than what Pete had seen on Utah Beach. That was something like a 22-day battle. It was terrible. It just, we lost a lot, a lot. I lost our... Our general, he couldn't wear a, a helmet, a steel. He wore a lighter. But if they ever caught us without our steel helmet on, they would court martial you. they say, that's your life. Well, they found half of his head off. It's devastating. But it, it was rough all over for everybody. And, uh, and then when uh, about uh, the fifth day, the sixth day, seventh day, eighth day, tenth, up to the, we had them on, on the run. And uh, we really didn't have time to, to think about anything. The British and American forces continued from town to town in an effort to drive the Germans back towards Berlin. Some towns were taken, lost, and taken again. And wherever there was fighting, there was destruction. A lot of destruction. Like I say, St. Lowe, Colmar, Cologne, some beautiful, in Germany especially, some beautiful, beautiful buildings. In Nuremberg and Frankfurt, and them city was just, we just annihilated them. Well, we had to to get the Germans out. Progress continued until December. Only a few days before Christmas, 1944, Adolf Hitler launched a surprise attack, throwing every available man and machine at the advancing Allied forces. The surprise had worked. The American lines were broken, creating a rift 70 miles wide and 50 miles deep. The Battle of the Bulge had begun. That was their last big push, and it was big. We were numbfounded, you know. It was just that, that quick. And how that we never even had an idea about it, and and where they got all of them, we didn't know. How many the soldiers that they poured in there? They they trapped all of us in there. That was the worst of all. All of the fighting was there. That was the worst. Some of my friends weren't as lucky as me and five feet from you, five feet from you. And you say, how, how could they, and, and not me, you know. They decided that we wouldn't give up. And for the support that we had to come up immediately, especially the, I think it was the 42nd Division. Boy, they, they really, one of the divisions that really got us out of there. But that was the end of it. After that, why, it was all over. There was no more. After 40 days, the Battle of the Bulge was finally over. For the Allies, the end of the war seemed closer than ever. There was a notable change in their German enemies. While some were still dedicated to fight on, most seemed to have resolved within themselves that their Fuhrer was a madman. 
and for them, the war was all but lost. They wanted to be so peaceful, the Germans, you know, because they know that was it. And they realized it was over. And everybody was evacuated in Berlin to go to London there, and to fly over, you know, bail out. The surrendering Germans would much rather be captured by their British and American opponents to the West rather than their Soviet foes to the East. The conflict between Germany and the Soviet Union had been much more personal and severe. They knew they would receive no mercy from the Red Army for the atrocities the Nazi regime had carried out. Pete saw the effects of these atrocities firsthand when he took part in the liberation of Dachau, the original concentration camp, where prisoners were tortured, starved, and murdered. Many of those who survived to see their liberation were sick and dying. When the 283rd arrived, smoke still billowed from the crematoriums. More than 70 years later, these images, still vivid in Pete's memory, were too difficult for him to talk about on camera. But he and the 283rd had done their part, and soon it would be time to come home. We went to the channel then in uh, January of 46, and to get on the boat to come home. We pulled in there, and the docks were nothing but people. I said, there, there's no room to walk. They were all waving flags, you know. It was cold, but hell, half of them were, were didn't even have a cover on. For Pete, the welcome to his home country had been warm and well-deserved. But his own family had no idea he'd even made it back to the States until they received a phone call in the middle of the night. It was uh, 1.45 in the morning. My dad answered the phone and I said, Dad, I'm at the bus station. He said, who is this? I said, it was Pete, your son. You're where? And I said, I'm at the bus station. Oh, he said, well, uh, your brother's working uh, midnights and he doesn't get off till 7.30, you know, in, in the morning. So uh, I don't know who I can get. I says, that's all right, I'll take a cab. Here, in the meantime, my dad called Timpkin, where my brother worked, and, and told me you get in touch with Hobart Shaw that his brother's down at the depot, the bus depot. Go get him. When I go, uh, get in the door, why, my brother was just going by the car and he was going to turn around. He said, I'll bet you that's Pete. And I was. You know, got there at 2 o'clock in the morning on February the 9th. So it was a long spell. To this day, Pete is a highly celebrated veteran of the Second World War. In November of 2016, he was awarded with the French Legion of Honor, a prestigious award given by the government of France to those who serve in combat on French soil. Over seven decades later, Pete's service in the war still has a profound effect on his life. You gotta be friendly to people and, and try to, to understand them. I know a lot of them people over there, even the English. You know, they we're so sorry to see you over here. You know, that you have to leave your home to come over here. And the same with France and, and uh, Poland especially. You know, that they thought so much of us for doing what we're doing. I said, well, well we have to. So you see, that dwells on you, that they were so concerned about something like that. So it kind of made me feel, you know, you got to understand, like people. Hey everyone, I'm Josh from Memoirs of World War II, and I just want to say a big thank you so much for watching our first episode. We were so excited to finally bring this content to you, along with many other episodes that are to come. We're really excited for you to see it. Now currently we're releasing one episode on the first Friday of every month. We'd love to bring you more content more frequently, but we need your help in order to do that. If you'd like to contribute to what we're doing, you can click on the link below for our Patreon page. 
If you want to hear more amazing stories like these, please consider subscribing to this channel and click the notification bell so you can stay up to date when we release new stories. And one final way that you can support us is to share. Share these videos, share these stories, help us to honor these veterans and educate younger generations. We want to thank you again for your support and thank you for watching. Sponsors and all you fit veterans in the audience, I need you to get down and give me 22 everyday push-ups for the soldiers tomorrow, the veterans. That we sadly enough will take their lives. So get down and give me 22 everyday push ups.
also offer assistance on generating a writer's file for your websites, platforms, editorial services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services, just